uh, of course, the, does everybody, is everybody here a little bit versed on DJ technology, two turntables and a mixer, or do I have to take a really big step backwards here? <laughs> well, uh, quickly, basic uh, DJ setup that was in any club back then from 5, 10, 15, 20 years ago, of course, is your mixer and your two turntables. The mixer being something which enables you to mix the two records together. Uh, what everybody else was doing at that time was just playing a record and then crossfading and mixing into another record. Some people were able to align the beats together, which made them sound very, you know, flawless and you could very, it was hard to tell when things were coming in and out. Uh, but that was about it. In Detroit, I started going, you know, down to the shelter, listening to Derek play. And he would do all these crazy things, uh, what was called uh, EQing, which at that time an EQ was a way to make your sound sound better by if your EQ works by taking certain frequencies out or by accentuating the frequencies you could in effect change the records again at this time most clubs most club owners most parties you went to the EQ was back here, locked behind some like grating. I remember actually at the shelter sometimes we'd try and take screwdrivers out so we could actually play with it. But luckily, some some bright some, some bright engineer started to release mixers with uh, you know more intricate EQs on them. And this is what Derek was using. So he'd be playing a record and you know taking all these things out, and he'd start using say the very very high parts of one record and the very low parts of another record. So when it came together, it was this new third record that didn't exist, but it was much more than just two records on top of each other. He was starting to pick uh, the frequencies, the, the parts that kind of went together and, and, and complemented each other. And I don't know if that came from him being uh, a producer or just thinking differently, but that was, uh, you know, as, as, as simple as it sounds, that really wasn't happening anywhere else, you know? And uh, I, I started to, you know, notice this as uh, I started to travel more. In around 1990, I started uh, with my partner John Aquaviva, a record label called Plus Eight. And uh, shortly afterwards, we had like, an underground hit, whatever that means, but uh, with Dan Bell and John and I under the name Cybersonic. And uh, suddenly, people wanted a DJ to go over and play this record overseas. They wanted someone from the Plus Eight camp to, you know, kind of play their Detroit Windsor sound, whatever it was we were doing. And uh, so I, I went over there, I went over to London, and the first thing I noticed was what I'm talking about now, is that no one was EQing. No one was doing anything different. It was just, you know, everyone was into Acid House, everyone was into Detroit techno, but it was like, it was nearly like playing back, playing playing by numbers. Here's one record, here's another. Here's another record, here's another. And it was, you know, for someone coming from Detroit at that time, growing up, going to the Music Institute, and, you know, in a dark room, and hearing just these, these walls of sound and high frequencies coming out, low frequencies, and these records that I knew, you know, off by heart by then, getting morphed into something completely different, Going to London was a little bit of an eye opener. It was like, man, you guys need to wake up. These guys were, you know, really into techno, really into acid house. But it was like they were nearly. I'm not dissing anyone over there. Well, I guess I am. But a lot of the people, it was just like they were regular DJs who had come up through the 70s and 80s playing soul music, which a lot of them were, just playing them back. Not really. There was nothing, nothing really progressive about the way they were playing their music. And I think. You know, that's what I got from Derek and those guys, and that kind of point is what's carried on throughout my career, that electronic music, when I heard Derek's records, when I heard Kevin's Wands, all these guys, it was futuristic music, it was, it was alien music. I, there was no way, you know, every time you tried to classify it, it, it kind of moved, it moved ahead again. And as much as the music was like that, I find, uh, and I, and I, when I look back, you know, the, the, the mentality of the DJs, in every aspect was also that in Detroit. It wasn't, you know, if, if you're making futuristic music, you have to make, you know, you have to perform futuristically. And that's, uh, you know, kind of what I guess I've been trying to do for the last 10 years. Find uh, new ways of performing, whether it's a, a live performance or whether it's a DJ's performance. Find new technologies, old technologies, or wrong technologies to do something different and to 
mark the nights that I play as something really significant and special, kind of like the nights that I remember in my head from the early days in Detroit, or not just Detroit, because I've, you know, I've had great experiences throughout, uh, all over the, uh, I guess all over the world now, but those first points in Detroit, hearing again Derek and those guys play, when they were doing these crazy things, it was like, well, they were doing something unlike anybody else, and those are things I'm gonna remember for the rest of my life, because they were doing something different. And uh, that's kind of, I think, what the whole mentality of, um, Detroit and Detroit techno has always been for me. So anyway, when I was over in England doing, uh, you know, I, uh, this, uh, uh, doing these gigs and DJing and stuff like that, I remember this one show, which I don't know if I'll use my quote, which Derek wants me to use, <laughs> but I was at, uh, you know, I started to notice how, how much an impact you could have by changing these records. I was playing at a club called Saber Sonic, and, uh, you know, I was just doing what I normally do around, I guess, around here, and uh, playing two records, you know, dropping the bass out, creating tension, creating anticipation, and uh, you know, suddenly this crowd was just started going completely off, much like the crowds were going off here back then. But uh, you know, the promoter came up to me, and people started coming up to me and said, "What the hell are you doing?" You know, I thought I was crazy. I was, you know, doing all this stuff with the EQ, and suddenly there was just a, and everyone's like, "Well, where'd the record go?" but suddenly the crowd was going absolutely ballistic when it kicked back in. Like it was just a, a, an incredible energy rush. And uh, so it, it was just really easy, to, I guess apparent for me to see that this was the way forward for uh, performance and for, for DJing and, and, and for my career. Uh, shortly after that, I started to also delve into live shows under the name Plastic Man. This is 92, 93. And uh, that was a whole, whole, I guess, a whole new ball of wax. What what that entailed was, you know, forget all this, the, the DJing equipment. It was like taking my whole studio out on the road. Um, in a lot of ways, it was the biggest pain in my ass. You know, carrying all, you know, every you, uh, people probably see now, you know, the laptop technicians. They take their laptop around, and that's all they need. But back then, there was no such thing as you know, Reason or any of these programs that you can do all these sounds on. And it was uh, me by myself with probably, you know, two or three of these huge crates, carrying them around, sending them to, over to London, doing all these sound checks and stuff. And uh, once everything was going, the potential that I had in front of the, for the crowd was, was unbelievable because I had all these special effects, all these things that I had in my studio to do trickery with, new ways to... Uh, play one of my songs, like I don't know, Spastic or uh, one of the early Fuse records, but you know, play it in a different way again. And, and and again, I just started seeing people recognize what I was doing, and then suddenly say, "Well, this isn't exactly like the album version. This isn't exactly like I heard someone else play it." And just saw, you know, that kind of it's kind of like pulling the rug out of from people's feet a little bit, giving them something that they know, giving them something which is comfortable, but then kind of twisting it a little bit. And uh, that got me to thinking, well, is there a way that I'd, I, could, I could have this potential without taking all this stuff around? That was, I was a little bit lazy, too, I think. So, But uh, was, it, would there be a way of kind of combining the potential of the live show, the equipment of the live show, but have the opportunity to play other people's music a lot with records and kind of cross this idea of, of DJing and, and, and live performance? And that's kind of where the very, very, very first beginnings of uh, what I guess I refer to now as DexFX 909 came about. And uh, I did a number of experiments. Maybe some of you guys were there in, in kind of the early days of, of, of 93, 94, around Detroit, around Toronto. You'd see, a, if you came to any of the parties, it was a really strange setup. We had a, there was no actual technology to do what I wanted to do at that point for DJing. Uh, there wasn't any of these fancy mixers with all these, you know, lots of, you know, knobs that do crazy things. So I actually had to use two mixers. So you had something here to play the records. I had this other big thing up here. You usually couldn't ha you know, really see me because I was hidden behind all this stuff. And somehow, plugging all this stuff in uh, kind of back to front, I was able to kind of combine that idea of the live performance and the DJ performance. And, uh, you know, when I started doing this, the, uh, 
you know, the, result, the results were in instantaneous. You know, I was able to play you know, any of these records that people knew and suddenly completely mutate them beyond what I was able to do with, it, with this EQ. Because of that, you know, by that time, other people had started to use the EQ. It had become commonplace. And uh, I guess that's another thing that drives me forward and along uh, you know, with technology. There's, as, it, as it moves forward, there's always people, uh, other people trying similar things. And once everybody else is trying it, I'm usually trying to find something new, a new angle. Because again, doing these things is what dis um, distinguishes me from the rest of the guys or the rest of the girls, whoever is out there performing. And uh, so I was always looking for that new angle. And uh, using these uh, new boxes and things, the next thing I kind of added out to the EQ was uh, using an effects box. And uh, what that does is uh, it gives me a number of different uh, possibilities to change the record again, to uh, mutate it, uh, to add or subtract different frequencies. And uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep playing this record, so by the end you'll probably get really bored of it, but uh, it's the best way to demonstrate the differences. So, so again, we had the we had all the EQ tricks. By 93, this was kind of played out and uh, everyone was doing it. And actually, by that time, a lot of the equipment manufacturers had also caught up and had started releasing mixers with EQs built into them because pre-1990, a lot of them didn't. And if they did, still the club owners were like locking, putting a lock and key under it. So the next thing I, I added was an effects box, which doesn't really... They all look differently, but this is what's here. So if anyone's seen me play recently, I usually have some kind of crate full of gizmos, and this is w one of the ones I'm using right now. And uh, this enables me, the effect I have right now is a delay, so I can start to play with things a little bit more. trying to make people dance so it's everything syncopated but I'm not worrying about it so much today so I can do it if you if, I, if you need me to prove it come to the next party <laughs> um, one of the um, kind of the problems I started having when I started using all this equipment especially when I had this other mixing board up here uh, was that I found out I only had two hands and uh, it, it was becoming increasingly difficult to do all these things and do them in time to uh, for the crowd's reaction. And uh, so my kind of, uh, I'm gonna hold this up. My secret weapon became this, which is like an old guitar pedal, which actually, I, in, in a lot of ways, Dex and Effects 9 and I wouldn't have been able to uh, even happen without this, because this is kind of my third hand. And this enables me to change some of the effects parameters. So if I'm taking frequencies out of a record, if I'm doing special EQ, EQ routines, if I'm doing these, these delays, this changes a, a certain parameter so that I can have my hands free to, well, mix. I don't scratch, but you know, so, so you can hear it change. So that was a, another kind of, uh, uh, kind of looking for new technology and old technology that could enable me to do something interesting. One of the, uh, the things I had to look for is uh, even the effects box that I was using in the early days, not all of them can be controlled this way. So it was always a, a thing of trying to find the, the right box to do the, the, the right thing, and which would, do any, which would also give me uh, the most power without uh, bringing in a whole box load of, of, of equipment, so.
One of the uh, next kind of uh, developments, which actually I, we didn't even bring it today, and I just noticed that, but uh, uh, was uh, another crossover from what I was doing in my live performances, and that was trying to add a little bit more uh, spontaneity into my into my shows. And uh, some of you may have seen, for a while I was using a, a, a TR-909 drum machine in my shows. And what that enabled me to do was not only play people's records and not only um, mutate them with these effects, but to also add in new, pr new pr uh, production or new percussion over top. Again, just to change the records. Uh, and, and not only was, you know, it wasn't just a technology or, or the other people who were, who were doing some of the things that, that were driving me forward. It was as this scene has got bigger and bigger, um, you know, when I started out, when, you know, 10 years ago, if I had this record, particular record, perhaps I was only one of the only ones in Detroit with it, or maybe there was like two or three. And if people were going out every night, maybe they only heard it once or twice a month. And as things have got, as this whole scene has got bigger and bigger, more commercial or more popular, people have been hearing the records more often. You know, you can go to the store now and buy the best of, you know, house or the best of techno or a Jeff Mills mix CD or my mix CD, and here's some of your favorite records. And you nearly become, uh, you, you nearly know the records uh, too well. So it's, if, if everyone's listening to all the stuff that all the DJ's playing, I started to think, well, then it, it, it's getting, again, it, it, it's making my job harder because it's, I'm up there playing these records back, people have got these at CDs, they're listening to them at home. There's got to be s another way, or I've got to uh, search for more possibilities to allow me to change these records again. It's, it's nearly like I'm on a quest for being able to play you know, someone's favorite record that they've heard for 20 or 30 times to them again for the first time. So they're like, oh, I know this record. I love this record, but I've never heard this. I've never heard this version before. Or, you know, what has he done to it? Just again to pull that rug out from beneath the feet to, to, to make things a little bit uncomfortable because you know some of the. You know, I guess we 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 go to these clubs and we want to dance or we're listening to this music at home. But uh, if it's just a, a run of the mill night and someone plays all their favorite music back and forth, it just gets, it, again, it isn't memorable. There's got to be some kind of, something which is uncomfortable or something which is, you know, what's, what is this? What is he playing? What is he doing? Uh, is this a remix? Is this, is this uh, a special re-edit? Or, you know, is this a brand new track? And it kind of like start starting to pose questions to people. So, you know, again, they're, they're thinking about it. So that's always kind of been in the back of my mind to, you know, in, in this quest for what equipment to use and, 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 and why I'm doing it. It's uh, just another reason to uh, mark that that evening for the people, uh, for the person to to really identify uh, kind of a like a moment in time, you know, so that hopefully in 10 years, people who've been to my shows will either look back and have those as the things that they thought were important enough to lock away in their, in, in, their, in their memories. Okay, I'm gonna look at my notes because I'm getting a bit, bit sidetracked. Uh, one of the other, um, as I started to, to uh, use some of these technologies, the, uh, the effects and everything else, uh, it started to also help me start to think about music in a, a slightly different way. Um, taking another little step back, when, when I began, it, it was this basic EQing technique, and it was about playing two records on top of each other. Then I added the effects and, and further instrumentation, or the 909, and it started to become more like remixing the records that I was playing. And when you start to think that way, I started to, to listen to the, to the records not in a, I guess a linear fashion, you know, uh, which is a way I think a lot of other DJs were, were thinking of music at that time, just playing back the record the way it was recorded. I even have fr some friends who are, you know, like DJs just to play back the record the way it was made. You know, this is the way the producer made the record, just play it back and then play the next record. But I was, you know, I, I, I didn't think that was right. I thought that there must be a way to, you know, uh, interact with these these records to create something new. That's what a DJ does, overlays two records to, to create something new. And uh, 
you know, that's what these technologies are, are also enabling me to do, but at, in, in a greater way. And uh, the more I did this, the more I started to think about these records I was playing, more as just kind of samples and bits and pieces, small little loops, uh, uh, just things that I was kind of sequencing together for one hour or four hours or eight hours at, at, you know, at a club or in my studio. And uh, so I started to experiment a little bit uh, with these ideas in the studio and also out using the, these effects and everything. And kind of where that led me to, uh, which was probably around 97, 98, was taking a record that had been quite a, a large hit and trying to reevaluate that record by relooping, resampling, and all this. And uh, the the record I chose was uh, this record, uh, Yellow. Oh yeah, which of course was a big hit. I had been playing it in my DJ sets towards the end of the night. I was using these effects and everything to change it. You know, uh, I, I was seeing the reaction of the people. You know how kind of startled they were when they first heard this Oh Yeah track coming in and then hearing it kind of get reevaluated in a li in a live situation. So I took that into the studio and created this track Minus Orange. And while in there, uh, while I'm manipulating all these different loops and things, I started to get um, a further idea of where I wanted to go. I, I guess records and tracks started to become nearly smaller and smaller. I started to think in this kind of uh, as everything is components. Uh, and uh, that's the next thing after Minus Orange uh, was the, the first DE9 record, uh, the Dex FX 909 Volume 1. And what that CD wanted to capture was kind of my live performance at that time with the Dex FX, the 909, overlaying records, trying to play these records differently than anybody else had, and just give things a new twist, I guess. And, uh, you know, it's. I, I guess it was successful in capturing what I was doing live, but I didn't really, I wasn't as happy as, as I wanted to be when it was done. I thought it was still, the, the records, it was still too linear. It was still, you could still see too much of the remnants of the, the tracks, how they were originally. You know, when the, the part that Jeff Mills part came in, it was still basically his track. It still, it was slightly reworked, but it really wasn't, um, it hadn't been changed too much. And that's when I started to really kind of delve into some other technologies. Some of them have changed now. I've got some different ones up here uh, to try and get beyond this linear approach and to get closer, well, which ended up being the title of the record, uh, get closer into the edit, closer into the music I was playing and have even more potential. Get beyond just overlaying effects into on top of records, but get into the records themselves. And one of the uh, components I used well, this isn't exactly the same component, but I started to uh, experiment, uh, experiment with samplers. If you want to get this, there's a, and around this time there was a lot of computer technology coming out. Uh, programs like Acid and and Recycle, if anyone's uh, uh, you know aware of these programs, but there was a lot of there's kind of a turn, a technology turn to getting into into records closer, really just sampling things and relooping them and uh, uh, kind of deconstructing uh, the music that we're listening to. So this, this little box here, same record. Um, This box uh, enables me to start to re re uh, rework with the records and take smaller components out uh, and, and really have more potential of, I guess, remixing or, 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 again, pulling that rug out of people's feet. Everyone's expecting a break to come in. Everyone's expecting uh, the hi-hats to go out. Everyone's expecting the bass line to come in. And I can just take that record away and uh, I'll leave, a, you know, make that passage longer or just Again, just use that to mix into another record or take another sample from another record and overlay that. So it's really starting to change the structure. Because I think people, it's not only are people when they're at the clubs listening to, you know, the, the, the acid lines or all this, but people get very uh, aware of the structure of songs. So even, even if they don't recognize a the song, they kind of remember when a certain part comes in. So this enabled me to really kind of change that and again, create some type of 
tension or some type of some type of anticipation, waiting for the event that possibly wasn't going to happen. Sorry. Um, and that, using this technology out, out live, really started to get me interested in, you know, how the idea, you know, the, how the whole realm of DJing was going to develop even more. You know, was it going to be possible to get away from, you know, just playing these linear records, and uh, you know, at this at this point, I was getting a little bit tired. I was getting tired of carrying 200 records with me. I was getting tired of uh, even the, the equipment I was taking with the Dex Effect 909 tour. It was just I was at a point where I could only deconstruct the records so much. You know, there needed to be some type of new way to play music back, and. Um, that's kind of when I started hearing uh, some rumors, well, I, um, you know, and some kind of web pages uh, talking about uh, early Final Scratch technology. And uh, this has been around for, in various stages of development, about three or four years. Uh, Final Scratch, which I'm going to explain a little bit more in a minute, was uh, developed by two hackers, actually one main hacker in, in, in Amsterdam um, at an MP3 convention. And it was kind of a, one of those you know, silly things where someone was, was, some guy was DJing and playing back MP3s and uh, just, by, uh, just off of a computer. And this guy was like, oh, that's, that's a stupid way to do it. There's got to be a better way to control. And someone said, well, why don't you just use a record to control an MP3? And everyone was like, well, you can't do that. Of course, you say that to a hacker, then he's going to do it, right? So about eight, six months later, he had a, a very rough prototype, which uh, jo my partner, John Aquaviva, got to see. And I saw the later pr prototype, which did what it does now, which I'm going to show you. But there was a huge delay. So you were able to control MP3 files off of a record. But if I did a movement, about six or seven or maybe eight seconds later, something happened on the computer and you're like, well, that's cool. I'm not going to use that. Forget it. <laughs> Actually, jo John isn't as into technology as myself. And uh, he was totally blown away. So he, or or he ordered a system and everything. He was like, I'm going to use it. No, give me one. And it's still at his house on the floor and you can never get it working. So <laughs> but he, does, you know, he, he has the, the newer version now and he is using it. But um, you know, uh, over the development, uh, John and I kept in touch with these guys, and uh, we're just, you know, for for a number of different reasons, just got really excited about it, uh, about the idea of uh, carrying a lot of a lot more music with you uh, in a computer uh, than I, than it, that than was possible with with uh, uh, normal vinyl. But what really started interesting me was that perhaps this was the technology I was looking for. Perhaps this was going to allow me to play back music again uh, differently than everyone else, to perhaps you know, change music, re-edit music, and generally have a, you know, more potential to fuck with music than I'd ever had before. You know, it was finally not, not a perfect non-linear approach, but one step in the right direction. So. Where's my Final Scratch record? Um, the basic system, Final Scratch, is uh, kind of a three-way system. Uh, you have your laptop, which is right here. And uh, that's hooked up to your, your mixer, uh, any mixer. Uh, I'm not going to go into the specifics, but the one interesting thing about Final Scratch is that unlike a lot of other technologies, you don't need uh, specialized turntables. Or I, I've seen some other things that they put these big things on there, like computer-like chips or something that you know track movements and all this. All this stuff that sounds great, but you take it into a smoky club, it's just there's no way it's going to work. So Final Scratch does integrate into a really easy and, and general setup. So the, the unit is uh, you have the computer, you have a small interface box right here, which Basically, all this is is, a, is a, an in and out of your computer. This is bringing the sound in and out of the computer. It's not doing much more than that. Everything else is done in software. Um, and you have your record. And uh, if no one believes me, after I'm done blabbing away, people can come up and check this out and check this record. But it, it is, it's, a, it's a regular piece of vinyl. 
I don't ha I handle it as well as all my other pieces of vinyl. So, um, and I'll sh kind of show you what it does. First of all, here's a uh, really stupid demonstration of what you can do with a record. You know, the basic things you can do with a record and what DJs want to do is queuing up a record, backspinning record, playing it at the wrong speed. Uh, oh, I play records at the wrong speed. <laughs> one of my records, actually one of my favorite records I ever made, Panic Attack, under the name Plastic Man, sounds much better at 33, but it was recorded at 45. So, but it, on the label I put play at 33 or 45, so, you know, to each his own. So, this is what you can do to the regu uh, a regular record. You scan through the record to find the part you want. You know, you turn the record off. All that stuff. Final scratch. Um, once... Uh, I'll explain this first. Let me explain the interface before I demonstrate this. Uh, what you have up here is your left and right turntable. Um, and down below you have a, a searching mechanism to find your music because of course now that you're on a computer you don't have all these records to thumb through. There, you have to actually search for everything on the computer. And although it's really strange for anyone who's been DJing for a, a long period of time, once you get into searching th uh, for things on the computer it's much, much easier. Um, you know, I'll do some shameless self-promotion. So if I need one of my tracks, there's the, well, most of my tracks, except for this one right here is something that reminded me of my track, so I put my name in it just so I could find it very fast. But, uh, so, well, you know, this is the beauty of the system. Uh, you know, if anyone's ever seen any of my records, I have these really stupid little things, min, clicks, bomb. Half the time I, I can't remember what I wrote and I can't read my own handwriting, and I have little marks about which side to play and all that stuff. Um, I don't have temples like some DJs though, but that's another thing. Um, so uh, uh, one of the cool things about using a computer is you can start to tag uh, all your tracks with certain information, uh, whether it is beat per minute, whether it's musical type, house music. Uh, I have things classified as uh, classic, um, and I think with the word classic in it will show up. I have things like classic techno or Detroit classic, you know. So uh, it's, a, it's a great way of, of searching for your, for your music. But I'm going to show you more of this in a minute. So once I pick a track, I assign it to my left and right turntable. You can see on the left right now, if you can read it, it says Vitalik Pawnee EP Gigolo. Uh, you could put more information than that, but I guess I'm a minimalist, so I didn't put too much. Um, so for all intents and purposes, now the computer thinks your left turntable is this Vitalik track, which is exactly, should be, should be this track. Um, and uh, you put your final scratch record on. You take your other one off, because that's the way you scratch your records. And uh, put the needle on, and hopefully it works. Now what you're going to see is on the top of the screen, the top of the turntable left, you have a squiggly kind of line w at the very, very top. What that is, that's your, if anyone's used audio on any computers before, that's kind of showing the waveform, uh, uh, a graphical representation of how the music looks. And you can see, uh, can everyone see the red line in the very top left-hand corner, top of that? Okay, that, that's actually showing where you're, where you're playing right now. Below, you've got a 30-second window of what's actually playing so you can kind of uh, see what's happening. Because one of the problems, uh, one of the things that DJs are used to is if you actually look at every record, every record looks different. So when you're playing a record and you, you look where the needle is, you can actually visi visibly see dropouts, uh, uh, different frequency changes, and you can kind of use that to remember or, or kind of sign signify when there's going to be a change, when you're going to mix in. And this is what you can see on, on the screen here. So, this is the computer, you know, playing, you know, hopefully you trust me, but um, now I can do everything that you would be able to do with a normal record. Uh, I can backspin, and everything I do, you're, do, you're going to see change on the computer. I can play at the wrong speed if I want. 
of course I can use the pitch, which every good DJ needs, because you gotta try and mix these damn things. Final Scratch doesn't do any of the mixing for you, so if anyone wants to buy this to become a good DJ, forget it. You know, it's just gonna maybe save your back. Now the red, the red line at the very top, which is showing you where the needle is, uh, just like any other record, if I scan through the record right now, it will uh, update the point where you're playing and update everything else and play from that point on. And here you can see there's a dropout coming through the wave file. So that's the normal record. Try to find the same parts. That's the MP3 file or the computer file right now. So they're pretty much, well, they're pretty much identical, if, um, you know, except it's coming from the computer. Um, of course, you can manipulate this any way you want. beginning. Of course, if I'm really heavy-handed on the record and I actually skip the needle on the record, it's going to skip the file because it's figuring out exactly what's happening from where your needle is. So it, it, it doesn't fix a heavy-handed DJ either. But again, it starts to open up all these doors of, of new potential uh, because, you know, I guess you could use it to play back records like anybody else plays records back. You just play this file linear. But because you're playing now a computer file, a digital file, you have much more potential to start to interact with it beforehand. You can take that file and uh, re-edit it or add special effects that you couldn't do live in the studio. You could reverse it. You know, I, I, always, fi I always find these tracks when I'm traveling that you know, this great two-minute introduction, you know, really good drums, the bass line comes in, and then suddenly there's some terrible female vocal comes in, or any, it doesn't have to be female, but, um, no, I like some, and I do play some vocal records, but there's a lot of them which I, I just can't get into, or, or there's something, a, a strange sound comes in, and I'm always, I, I used to buy these records, maybe buy two copies, and try and mix back and forth, and, and sometimes it's just too small, it was just worthless for me, but, you know, for those records now, I can load those into Final Scratch, I can take that part I really like, double it, triple it, or you know, rework it in the studio just like I would with one of my own tracks and uh, load it back into Final Scratch and I have kind of a, whatever, my own distinct version of that track, that kind of Richie Houghton edit. Um, here's, I'll give you a kind of a little demonstration, um, a couple. This was uh, something I used, you know, if, I, if I show you now I won't use it again. I, Make, make sure I do something new. Um, at one of the last parties we did, I think it was uh, either the Jack party or the Control party, I, I really like this loop from this old Prince track, uh, 1999. So I, this is just a really simple e example. Um, I just looped it um, just so that I could play it. It's like a five minute loop and I was able to bring that in. Everybody who recognized it thought perhaps I was going to play Prince, you know, and kind of created a really kind of weird tension. What the hell is he doing? You know what I mean? And, and at the same time, I don't have it here, but I also had the vocal samples from the beginning of that saying, um, uh, don't worry, I won't hurt you, which I thought was kind of funny because the sound system was really punishing everybody that night. And I was playing that back and forth. And uh, again, it's something which, yeah, maybe it, it would have been possible to put on CD or to put on acetate, but these, you know, these, these, these are things which you can do much faster now and really, really interact with n nearly instantaneously. Uh, this was actually for the control party, I think, but the, uh, the, uh, the other party we had, we had a Jack party, and uh, I always wanted to play Jack Your Body, but I was kind of bored of it. So the Jack party was actually, I was flying back from London, England, the morning of that party, and on the plane, 
I opened up my final scratch system and uh, just decided to take Jack Your Body and cut it up into a whole bunch of different loops, a diff bunch of different pieces, so that throughout the night I could just bring the, you know, the, vo the vocal part, Jack, Jack Your Body, Jack, Jack Your Body, or just bring the bass line in, and uh, not worrying about having to uh, have two copies or anything, just really kind of plan ahead and have these kind of weird, strange things to play. So, uh, so this one is just, well, actually that's the original. So it's a little bit mon monotonous by itself, but of course, uh, my shows are a little bit monotonous sometimes, but that gave me a way of, uh, you know, kind of playing with things. And when you start, again, none of these technologies, I think, are going to like save the world by themselves, but uh, all together, when you start, you know, doing the EQs, um, you know, doing stuff like that. So that starts to, that was what, what uh, kind of started give, uh, showing me the potential of Final Scratch. Just to prove that this is actually the computer uh, going, uh, it's very easy to, uh, uh, I wouldn't do this as I'm playing out in front of a crowd, but to pick a new record, all you have to do is um, hold your control down and you just press F1 or F6 to assign it to a different turntable. So. Uh, once it's assigned, this record becomes that record. So I can just kind of show you how fast you can search for records and, and, and assign a new record to, to the turntable. Not only does it allow you to re-edit, do all these crazy things, but it also allows you, if you want to do it, be a master mixer and do all these things really fast, it enables you to speed your kind of movements up. And uh, you know, one of the hardest things of this whole system for me in the beginning was searching for music on this computer. I just felt really strange just like sitting here typing and you know, I was really, really fast going through and finding that record, like finding that green label or that scribble that uh, my memory kind of... Uh, told me was that record I wanted to play, but now that I've been using it for about nearly a year, it's much, much quicker for me. You know, if uh, even if I can't remember a name, I know I, the next track I want to play is a Mills track. I can go Mills, and I've got it there. Um, this is um, uh, where's that thing? The only bad thing is if you forget what it's called. I don't know if it's still in here yet. Uh, doo -doo -doo. For some reason, this one is always the one I can't find. I was going to show another example of, uh, of course, on this record, which everybody knows. And I love this record, but I'm totally sick of this record because every techno DJ in the world plays it at every party. Uh, so because everybody plays it, and I know it's, you know, kind of a, in a, some ways a crowd pleaser, I was like, well, it'd be really cool if I could play that and make it interesting again. So it's in here somewhere. But uh, what I did was take this line. Actually, I can kind of show you with this.
mix the record back in because after a while it would get annoying also. But again, another way of using the effects, the looper, the sampler, final scratch to further move away from just playing back music the way it was recorded. And, I, and uh, you know, to me, that's, you know, I, I think that's the way it, it's really going. I really, you know, I enjoy buying new records and hearing, you know, the way producers uh, are making them. You know, when I make music, I want people to enjoy it the way it's been made. But I think we're going to a time now where people are expecting things to uh, change as fast as everything else is changing in our lives. And uh, this is the technology that I'm looking for, really, to, you know, reevaluate, to uh, deconstruct and put back together music in front of people. You know, that's what I did 10 or 15 years ago with just two turntables and, and an EQ. And that blew people's heads off then. It was totally different. It was what we were all doing in Detroit, what other people weren't doing elsewhere. And as more people took that on, you know, it was time to find further technologies to, to do that again. To always, you know, I guess, it's, uh, try and be one step ahead of the, the crowd and to, to give them something again which is indescribable, something which is special for that moment uh, and something which is unique. And you can't do that by just playing two records back anymore. I don't think you could do, some people think you can, I don't think you could do that 10 years ago. So, uh, you know, it's, you, it, it really is, uh, you know, it, 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 that's also why I think, why, why I'm involved in, in, in electronic music. When, when I heard Derek's records, when I heard those early things, it was unlike I ever heard it, heard it before. And, or uh, it was unlike anything I'd heard before. And, uh, I think whether you're making music or whether you're DJing or performing, if it's electronic based, then it's technology based. And technology is changing every day, uh, pushing forward, mutating. And I think that's what we really have to do with our music. And I think whether or not the crowd knows it, that's what they want. That's, you know, everyone remembers that first night of hearing a new track or seeing a DJ for the first time, or whether it was going to the Banco building, or whether it was going to one of our parties, or going to see, you know, Jeff Mills play a couple of weeks ago with Derek. You know, it's those first experiences, those things where you just can't really describe it. Once you can describe it, it's boring. You don't really want to relive that again. Well, I, I, I don't. So I'm out there, as well as others are out there, trying to use all this technology to kind of push forward and you know, make it different once again. Um, after, if anyone wants to come up and play with Final Scratch and just kind of really see that it is working and it's not a big hoax, they can. Uh, I'm just going to do a little bit, a little bit more, and then um, we can have some, uh, I guess, some questions and answers. But the uh, this is kind of what myself and some other people are working on now or, or, or looking at using for our performances. Let me just stop this thing. Um, you know, when I created DE9 closer to the edit, which is only about, it's less than a year ago, one of the big things for me to do was to take my live performance, what I was using in front of everybody, and all the knowledge that I had in my studio, uh, all the computer components I had from Pro Tools to different, you know, everything possible to try and create an album which wasn't me, me mixing live. If anyone thinks I did that live, I didn't, forget it. You know, I would need about what, 20 hands, well, maybe not now, but, uh, uh, you know, uh, I lost my train of thought, sorry. <laughs> the, uh, um, but that album was trying to capture where I thought DJing or performance was going. And like I said before, that was taking small components from these records, mixing them together and creating something completely new. Not just playing things on top of each other, re-evaluating everything as closely, as tightly as possible. And uh, you know, last May when I recorded it, it took, uh, I think I worked on the project for about six weeks. The project consisted of about 600 loops 
which I had to cut up and f uh, optimize and all this. I ended up using about 300 on the actual record, but it was very time intensive, about six weeks of cutting, splicing, sitting in front of a computer screen, using Final Scratch to test some things, uh, playing records back and forth, and, and uh, you know, a hell of a lot of studio trickery to get to that point. And uh, towards the end of last year, uh, around August or, or September, a company in Berlin started to talk about this program called Live, which they were going to release. And uh, it's not a completely revolutionary program in the way that it, 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 it's more like a, a collection of other ideas and programs that have been out there, but it's executed uh, quite efficiently. It's uh, a number of things that have come together. And this program is something that, like I said, other people and, and myself are looking at using for our performances because it gets down to kind of the level of where Dex affects or D9 CE, how close to the edit was, taking, th you know, throwing away the composition as it was by the artist, taking, letting someone reevaluate those ideas and rework it completely live and spontaneous. So it, it is nearly possible to create something like Dex effects. Uh, completely, in fr you know, spontaneously or live in front of people. Um, this isn't going to be perfect, but a little bit of a kind of idea of what I'm talking about. This is, if anyone has a CD, track 28 from D9 CD, uh, CE. It's the wrong one. That's a, a certain section. I, I, I won't lie. This is one of the simplest sections of the pro of, of the the D9 CD to kind of demonstrate. Uh, it just makes it a little bit easier for me without having so many uh, different loops going. But that was made from a basic uh, about three components, three different records. Of course, you've got this um, that line, and then you've got the drums. Those are two different records. If actually, if anyone knows this this uh, little organy line, it's quite funny because it's. Uh, comes from a complete ambient record from Cologne. And uh, you know, the, the guy who made it thought it was pretty funny that I made his ambient record into a dance track. <laughs> so, but uh, that was uh, you know, created all in the studio. Uh, and there was really no way to do that a year ago live. And now we have this program called Live. And what I have here is uh, you can see right here it says Philip Cam, which is the ambient track. And then you have these different mosaic uh, 28 tracks. And what these are, are different loops. These are actually the loops that came from DE9, from, from the recording of the album. I didn't, there's nothing different to them. Uh, and now what I'm able to do is play these back on top of each other, cutting, uh, uh, kind of splicing, bringing different components in and out, uh, completely live and completely spontaneous, and redoing what I did in the studio a year or so ago for the D9 record, and of course, now that I can do this, it's kind of giving me the inklings of, of what go, uh, comes beyond Final Scratch. You know, I can do this in Final Scratch, but I have to think about it before. I want to take this Prince loop. I want to take um, this Jack Your Body loop, uh, you know, and, and do this. I need five minutes of it, or I need this, and then, then it should do this, and then it should do this. So, yes, it's, I can do uh, kind of spontaneous work, but it takes a lot of th uh, kind of thought forethought. Now I'm down to this. Uh, I can really move away from, uh, you know, basic structure of the tracks and uh, really start playing with things. So I'll just do a little demo here. Mm -hmm. 
So we have, there we have the basic track again. This is dealing like decks and effects in a box. Uh, once I get the, the exact way I'm gonna uh, try and bring this into my performances because I've got effects in here, I've got the samples, I've got the loops. So basically, in theory, throw this away, throw this away, throw this away, throw this away. And although I shouldn't say this, you know, probably throw this away too, <laughs> hopefully. And. Uh, from DE9 except for this last one you can see even with just like my finger here it's uh, starting to get really easy to spontaneously uh, remix re-edit re-evaluate all this music the only thing I have to do beforehand is get those loops ready but there's no uh, thinking about you know how I'm going to structure it you know forget how the artist structured it even forget how I want to structure it right now now I can structure it again right in front of the people and that is another big key for the whole Dex Effects 909 performance it's why I also use the 909 it was spontaneous it's you know how can you try to create something memorable or something special for the crowd in front of you when perhaps you've never played for them before you know, every time I play in Detroit, yeah, it's like playing at home, but it's always a slightly different crowd. The sound system's different, the the, the location's different, and uh, you know, you need to be able to spontaneously react to all those stimuli to create something really unique. And uh, you know, that's what all this stuff has done to me, done for me. And uh, you know, this is what I find, you know, really exciting right now because it's can I can really. Uh, I think take a big step ahead of what I've done and uh, have much more potential than ever before. And the more potential I have to kind of play with sound, with loops, with music, the more deconstruction I can do, uh, I think the, the, the more powerful the moment I can create for the people who are there. So I think that's about it. <laughs> uh, that kind of gives you hopefully a little bit of an idea of what what I do, why I do it, what some of you have seen me, do, you know, what, what you've seen me do at Jack or Control or any of the parties that perhaps you've been to, and uh, 
perhaps what you're going to hear, you know, at one at some of the next ones, you know. Hopefully, uh, I wasn't too boring. I think we're going to open it for uh, some questions, and uh, if anyone asks anything stupid, I'm just saying I'm ignore you. So please try and ask something intelligent. <laughs> uh, if there's, again, you can come and check Final Scratch out after if. Uh, if you have a question related to what I've done in the past or anything, you know, to my career, even if I haven't covered it, feel free to ask. Uh, I'm all up for any questions. Who's going to be the first one to start it? Oh, finally, good. <laughs> now it's like Oprah. <laughs> but Oprah doesn't have to wear this stupid thing. <laughs> Hi, Rich. I'm Sam from Ghostly. Mm. My question is um, <clears throat> concerning other reactions. The press has ob obviously been favorable to Final Scratch and what you've done, but your heroes in particular. Any? Actually, I was gonna I was gonna touch on that, uh, you know, without saying any kind of names. But uh, the the thing that really I find really amusing is, you know, when I started out, a lot of the traditional musicians. Uh, I guess people who are into more like rock or or that type of thing were saying, you know, oh, you guys aren't doing music, this electronic stuff. Anyone can use computers. Uh, DJs aren't musicians. Blah blah blah. And uh, I'm finding a similar backlash with some of, you know, the most established electronic DJs and artists with Final Scratch and even things like Live and stuff like that. A lot of them are. Well, you know, I like the turntables. Is this is this is how it's done? This is DJing. This is you know what the people know, and this is what I should do. And uh, you know, I, I think we're at a really interesting point right now because I think there is going to be a, a shakeup because it takes a whole new way of thinking for to, to I think to perform and to go where we're, we're going to go. Sure, there's going to be room for playback DJs or you know like like there's always been play people. Well, maybe not actually, but just playing back music to, to crowds who who want unchallenging experiences or unchallenging music. But for the most part, I think uh, the people who are really, really into electronic music want more from the performance, want more from the artists. And I think uh, hopefully a lot of the people will step up to the plate and start to experiment with this technology. You know, two turntables is, you know, it's ridiculous. It's, it's so archaic. Thanks. Thank you. Did, that, did I answer what yeah. you're talking Okay. <laughs> it's more of a technical question, but um, live, is it possible to interface with live through uh, external control devices, or is it yeah. something? Yeah, yeah, it's actually really, really, uh, the guys that are doing this are s really smart. You just, uh, uh, what you can do, you can, you can assign things to keys. I can just go click on any of these things here and assign them to the keyboard to, so I can have every loop assigned and just kick things in and out. You can also go there and edit the MIDI map and all the, uh, all the, uh, all the uh, sliders, faders and everything can be put to any type of controller, whether it's like a MIDI to, uh, you, know, like a, uh, you know, like a beam controller or just a regular fader. And, uh, you know, uh, for anyone who's seen this program, uh, it's, it's actually by, it's, you know, I'm a, I'm only plugging this company just because I think they're the coolest damn company in the world right now. Uh, it's Ableton, A B L E T O N dot com. If people want to check it out, but there's I'm only touching on the surface. Like I basically just showed you how to play a couple of loops back. You know, there is so much more potential in this program to like really start to even further deconstruct those loops and really really fuck with them. So it's you know you're not just gonna see or hear me or someone else with this laptop up there just playing a couple of loops back. It's going to go way beyond that. You can't ask a question. Well, Were you I was, I oh. was originally going <laughs> to I was originally going to ask you uh how you describe the minus sound, but um you seem to have uh talked about that earlier about how you just want to keep things fresh and new. Yeah, and I, I I think the uh, the minus sound, it, it, of course, it's a, a deconstructive sound. I think it's it's really about using, you know, th this technology to get really down to the basic fundamentals of sound. Uh, I'm really excited when I listen to things that just have a great balance 
to what is necessary and what is unnecessary. I think when I strike that, it's when I've done, I've created something really interesting, both in DJing or like an album like Consumed or, or something, or even like a, you know, a Dale Theorem release, or uh, we released some records last year uh, under the name Needlefleur, which are really, really minimal, just some sub bass and a couple of blips and blops, but it was, Perfect. There was, if you added anything else, it would have been cluttered and made no sense. And if you took anything out, it would have been like, well, something's missing. So that's kind of the balance we're trying to strike in what we're releasing and what we're looking for. Mm -hmm. uh, when you come up with a new sound, uh, when, when you, like you had the, the acid sound and uh -huh. the sort of hard techno sound, and now it seems to be more of like a soulful, groovy type sound, I've noticed with the, the, the latest <laughs> album. They are getting um, old. Uh, <laughs> uh, well, so, um, so I was wondering if the people on your label ever come into conflicts with that. Um, not really. I, I think uh, I would much rather my artists or the artists on the label like challenge, you know, challenge us and challenge the, the, the audience. Of course, you don't probably always see eye to eye with everything. Some people are going to take turns which you could uh, just aren't right, and perhaps they're better suited somewhere else. But you know, like take for instance, 1997. On Plus 8, we had two amazing albums. Clark, was it 97? <laughs> Hopefully. Uh, that was uh, uh, the Kooky Scientist album, which was by Fred Gianelli, who, who played at Motor on the Weekend, which was really funky and musical and, you know, very reminiscent of what's happening today in a lot of techno, really kind of soulful and groovy. Uh, and it was just a really fun, really cool album. And then, you know, Speedy J came up to us and delivered us this album, which was like, you know, futuristic noise. It was unbelievable. You know, it was, uh, it didn't do so well for us. People couldn't understand it. it was like, oh, where did the good old Speedy go? But it was, for me, I love all of his music he's ever done for us and for other people, but it was probably my favorite album because it challenged everyone and everyone at the label. We were just like, we didn't expect it. And that's exciting. You know, that's, you know, when I, I talk about seeing Derek back in the day and those guys, but, you know, when Derek, or any of these guys dropped records for the first time, like some of his tracks or future acid tracks or or you know, just you're just like, Wow, what the what the hell is going on? What is this record? What is this sound? And uh that's all what I've always tried to capture, whether it's a, a weird, you know, thing like the concept series or consume, but just something which is like, Well, this is different. There's something there's a new angle here. And uh those are the artists I want to work with and those are the records I want to buy, you know. And it's also even if you have a record like that, if it becomes a record that everyone's playing, then I want to be able to put a new twist on it. So someone hears my record or Jeff Mills' record again differently when they hear me play. And it's like, oh, it's, something's different, something's strange, something's not right. And when they're saying something's not right, it's probably, I'm probably doing something right. Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, I have a question. You talked about how um, in electronic music, it's constantly changing, constantly progressing. Um, where do you see technology enhancing live performance in the future, and where would you like it to go? Well, you know, I think something like live uh, is very interesting. I, 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 just the way, I hope that we're going to have, we're going to be able to more, more spontaneously interact with music. You know, it's now I'm taking loops and uh, samples from records, but I can't see why not, wh why we couldn't, for instance, be downloading or grabbing information or sounds or video images from the net in real time or, or you know, just information and translating it to something during the performance. This goes from a DJ to a musician to an artist to, to anything. Just really, you know, I really see myself as kind of reinterpreting information with technology, and most of that information now is dance floor based. But you know, hopefully, as we go uh, further into the future, there'll be newer interfaces, newer software programs, or hardware devices which kind of heighten that way of uh, of interacting with information. Hey, Reg. I'm curious about something. Um, I'm scared. <laughs> no, don't be. Well, I'll, I, hope it, I hope you shouldn't be scared. Um, I know that you have um, records that are really special to you, favorites that you, you know, save out for special moments or whatever. Mm. Um, I'm wondering, as you, um, as you start breaking things down into smaller and smaller pieces, do you find yourself losing that um, 
connection to an entire piece when you're only looking for just a tiny little portion to use? You know, I think it's always trying to find the, there's always something in a record that is, is part of that special quality. Maybe it's a hi-hat pattern or it's a string line or, or, or a certain loop of, of, of ideas. And I'm trying to find those parts in, in, in those records. You know, it's, I love listening to, you know, classic records and, and playing them out, you know. But I always get that kind of like, you get that warm feeling, oh, I remember the Banco building and stuff like that. And, and then after the warm feeling goes away, maybe after 30 seconds or a minute, I'm like, well, that was then. Fuck that shit. You know, I don't, I don't, that was great then, but how can I play this record so I get that feeling, but updated now? Can I do it with that record, or do I just throw that record away and find a new record? Do I take, um, you know, the, the, you know, the, you know, a little clip it from, from Jack Your Body and loop the bass line differently so everyone hears it and they're like, is this Jack Your Body? It's, well, maybe it's not, but it gives them that kind of feeling of what Jack Your Body did the first time you heard it. So I don't think it, it's, it's, it's really hard to do. It doesn't work all the time, and there's probably records where maybe I won't be able to do that too, but that's kind of the, the, the challenge, you know, trying to, you know, we have probably similar records that we, you know, kind of take us back. And uh, I'm much more interested in making um, a moment for people now, how we feel about eight years ago or, or two years ago. You know what I mean? Making that moment that in a couple of years they're going to look back at. But hopefully they won't just look back and reminisce and get old like so many people. They'll look back, think about it and say, well, I want to find another experience like that. I want to hear a new record like that, a new sound. And out of all the musics and genres I've ever heard, electronic music seems to, it's not always perfect, but it seems to have the most potential because of its tie with technology to always, you know, reevaluate itself and give you another experience. <laughs> Hi, I'm, I'm curious about how you feel about um, the increasing number of musicians who play, say, acoustic instruments or playing with other groups of musicians live and not only incorporating electronics into the music that they're making, but actually incorporating the styles of music that uh, strictly electronic artists have been uh, performing up until this point. I, I was never, there's some acoustic stuff I like, I was never a big fan of it, but uh, um, and I think as long as at the heart of it there's some type of progression, and I think that uh, is apparent in, when, you, when you hear a piece, if that was kind of the intention, that there is this kind of forward thinkingness to the way they either produced it or the way they integrated things, you know, uh, and, and at the same time there's a lot of other musicians trying to integrate electronics with other types of forms of music to just really kind of relive what's happened before. But as long as, they, again, they have that kind of perspective, let's take these techno ideas that are kind of futuristic or whatever and take these ideas and try and make something which hasn't uh, existed before. That's, you know, that's, I guess, the, the common goal. And you, uh, and you see, you know, finally a lot of uh, musicians from all different types of genres using technology now and, and filtering things or sending guitars through this or vocals and, s and resampling vocals and you're starting to hear really contemporary music which is very strange and uh, I think that's you know uh, a positive thing so So <laughs> something that I'm pretty interested in is uh, the, the way that you create a sense of environment mm. at your parties. And you kind of talked about, about that in terms of music. But I'm also, I'm also interested in you know, sort of the, the history of how you developed uh, the way that you have the room set up or the way that you, you know, who you uh, interact with in terms mm. of doing that and how that's developed over time and that's how important that is to you. It's a big one. It's, uh, it's, it is, it's very important. I think, you know, I guess what I've been talking about tonight really is about, you know, music, but again, marking a specific moment in time, creating something that makes an impression on someone. And I noticed very early on that, you know, to, to do something, uh, to, to make an impression on someone, there's many other forces acting on them than just music. Um, you know, I remember that back to the time when, you know, uh, 
Derek was playing. <laughs> oh, sends back to Derek today. Uh, but uh, uh, at the Music Institute, and there was really that was just like a dark room and a huge sound system. And I remember uh, remembering the kind of the emphasis on the sound there, and because many other clubs were, yeah, the DJs were playing, but th this sound was just like enveloping. You know, and this dark room was enveloping. It was the same as at the Banco building when, he, when we did our first parties, uh, Hard and Harder and all those things. Uh, back then, we started just doing the black plastic to, uh, to get rid of all external uh, stimuli so people could only focus f on the music or focus within and really kind of take a step away from, them, from themselves. And uh, through doing that and kind of experimenting, it just, you know, became more apparent how important the environment was to the overall experience. So, uh, you know, we've done lots of uh, different uh, um, experiments over the years, like at, uh, at the Consume Party in Pontiac. We had a quadraphonic system, which, uh, you know, I'd love to do again, but it was a technical nightmare. Uh, but we're hoping to do it again. But that, you know, further playing with space and dimensions of the room to really interact with the people uh, in that space. You know, because, uh, you know, I, I talked to other uh, DJs and stuff, and everyone, I guess, is sometimes nearly too um, overwhelmed or too uh, focused on the music. And uh, yeah, it wouldn't be here without the music. It's, it is definitely the most important component, but you know, I've, we've always, you know, myself and uh, the guys at Minus, my crew, we've always taken into all the other consideration, the heat of the room, the intensity of the lights, how the absence of light or how that quick burst of white light or is going to work together with that record I'm playing. Uh, how the, you know, how annoying uh, an intense smoke can become when you could hardly, or you, you know, you can hardly see anything or hardly breathe and how, what a rush it is when you come out of that, both musically and both uh, emotionally, really. So uh, it's hard to go into all that, but it, it's, it's uh, definitely something which interests me just as much as the music I'm doing. And I think the last year or so, the, the parties we've been doing around here have been, th those ideas have been there, but we're, I think, trying to take a step uh, even further into that now. But uh, yeah, it's, uh, there's so many different things you can do, so many new technologies to, for the environment. But uh, I don't really want to do parties for $80 just to pull off the ideas I have right now. So we're trying to, Clark's working on it. <laughs> we're, hopefully we'll pull it off. And I think the next thing we're looking at doing is uh, trying to get back to uh, some quad setups uh, on the musical level and, uh, and then really delve back into the environments. You know, because there's, there's, you know, there's a lot of artists, uh, like uh, kind of, artist-based artists, not musicians who are doing environments and things like that, but there's not so many people around the world that really take this view on the whole thing. You know, I, we've had people come to a, our parties to play or, or other DJs and, and see, and they're like, well, you guys are crazy. <laughs> but when you see all those things come together, you know, it's not just about, you know, yeah, the effects work, the, uh, the sampler works, Final Scratch work, this works. But you know, this is interesting with live. As, as I start to go more on a computer-based things, uh, when I have things like MIDI and, and all these things working in my favor, uh, the idea of hooking that up to light ri lighting rigs and all that starts to get really interesting. Because the, 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 the thing we've been working on the last two parties, jack and control, and the whole idea with the control idea is taking that to the next step further and giving one person in the room full control over the whole environment, which kind of a ha I've had in the past, but not kind of beforehand, not during. And now I'm starting to get that during, and not just with fog machines, but just with like full lighting rigs and controls right next to me. So if I'm dropping a fader on, on our audio, I can bring up a fader on the lights or vice versa. So that's kind of what we're exploring. And uh, yeah, it's. That's where things get powerful. You've got to have, you know, we don't just listen, you know. We see, we smell, we feel, so see what happens. <laughs> That's um, in your last answer. Um, but the question I have is that over some of the computer-based shows that I've seen, I kind of felt this disconnection with the, with the uh, artist. Um, I kind of felt that even with the great music that I was hearing over the sound system, um, 
it, it almost as if that that could have been recorded yeah. and the skeptical side i couldn't stop thinking that the the artist up there was was simply you know playing solitaire well, instead of actually playing the music yeah. um do you feel like that is a, a challenge that, that you have to get over or how do you see as um, dj performances continue to move into the computer-based area do you see that as a a challenge and how do you plan on attacking that? I, I think it is definitely a challenge. I've seen so many laptop technicians who sound amazing, but it's like Snorville. It's just, you know, like, it, it's strange for me to say that actually, because I, you know, when I go to a club and dance, I usually just close my eyes and try and take in the music. But I know there is a certain thing about the performance of the person creating. And I, I don't know if it's just watching someone and they're not doing much and it, it, it's boring that way, but I think there is that underlying fear or knowledge that perhaps they're not doing as much as they pretend they're doing. I've seen so many, and I think I have a, a bit of a, an interesting outlook on it because when I did my live shows in 93, 94, 95 with Plastic Man, um, part of the reasons I stopped doing them in a way and went, went to Dex FX 909 was that I was carrying all that equipment. The reason I was was to give myself the potential of interacting with the crowd when I did a live show. So there was loops playing, yeah, there was pre-planning, but the sequencing, the structure, the arrangement could really change uh, from night to night. You know, when I played Glastonbury in 95 or when I played Toronto or Spastic here, there, are, yeah, the same tracks were played, but in completely different orders, different effects. It was, it was really, it was kind of a, it was a little bit organic. And, uh, you know, there, there, it's gonna be really, Interesting to see how many people follow that path with the laptops, with how, as DJing goes into this thing, it, uh, because some people will probably pre-plan too much. You know, when the, I think that's the problem with computer technology. You can pre-plan, you can perfect, and you can isolate, and 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 uh, and, and just just sit there forever, and everything d does become too perfect. And. Uh, you know, I think what we were just talking about with the parties, I think it's going to go beyond uh, just playing music. I really see, hope, you know, I see myself uh, now and, and definitely in the future really trying to take the parties that we do here on the road throughout the world because it, it is more than just the music and more than just a party, it's an experience. And perhaps I won't be playing records, but, and perhaps I'll be behind two or three laptops but I'll be controlling lights and the intensity of, of different objects, the, the sound, the, the level of the sound, but all as fluidly as possible and as spontaneous as possible. Because again, if I want to create something which is memorable and something unique, I can't just play the same sequence every night, even though, that the pe you know, even though I could. I could do this exact same sequence, the exact same show at uh, Control, and then take it to London, England, and do the same records in the same order. No one's going to really know. A couple more people now than 10 years ago because there's the internet. But, uh, you know, it can be done. And I think a lot of people are taking advantage of that. But, you know, you have, you have uh, my permission to kick me in the head if I fall into that trap. <laughs> I don't think I will. Hello. Uh, you mentioned something about taking advantage of um, DJs. Th there's like this mainstream um, DJ that's uh, re-spinning music that you mentioned and is collecting a large amount of money. What are you talking about, Paul Ogilvold? <laughs> <laughs> well, there's... I didn't say that. I think so. I got just got some, <laughs> picked something radio signals up. <laughs> I see like this large division happening between pe people who are, are interested in new music and creating and um, you know some of the various names that you probably know. Um, how do you think that's affecting all of us? Um, yeah, as long as we don't get jaded about it, you know, then I don't think it really affects us. I know some other uh, producers and DJs uh, kind of in similar similar to myself, uh, my peers, who get really upset when they hear people are coming in who've only been doing it for five years or are playing more commercial and getting all this money and they just go in, they play the same records, they're not really mixing. But it's not what I do. It's not, that, it's not what we're all here for, I don't think. That's not what we're involved in. So, you know, this music is going to get uh, f for, you know, more popular. It will 
uh, further reach the, the masses. And uh, as it does that, we'll be, you know, slowly moving, well, hopefully not slowly, you know, uh, at ever-increasing speed, moving along, hopefully innovating and, and doing different things. You know, that, that's what's, you know, there's nearly like a self uh, destruction mechanism built into what we're doing because every time if you want to make something popular and you want to take it to the to to uh, uh, to a commercial level you need to kind of like take it define it explain it and then give it to everyone so they can take it for mass consumption but every time you do that to electronic music by the time you take it to the people you know we're over here so as long as we don't mind some people are going to take that give it to the to the, the mass population to make a hell of a lot of money on it, then so be it, you know. I hope that, um, you know, I, I always thought like other artists like, you know, uh, you know, even like Moby or Paul Oakenfor, Sasha Digweed, all these people, uh, not saying anything bad about them, Chemical Brothers, these are all people who are related and have come up through what I do, what Derek does, all these people, but they're bringing P uh, a lot of new people into this, and I hope that some of those people will filter down through to people like myself and Carl Craig. And if they find us, some people are going to really like what we do, some people aren't. And some people are going to say, what we do is commercial, and they're going to go down further and then find people like, you know, whatever, Basic Channel and Pole, and then go down even further and find the kid in the basement twiddling knobs and playing with the Max MSP and making really crazy stuff, you know? Because my stuff is a little bit experimental, but not compared to other people, I'm, I'm commercial. So. It's all in the perspective, right? But if, he, if Paul Okafor gave us some, one of his fees, we could probably do a really cool party. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was, uh, oh, this is weird, oh, hearing <laughs> myself <laughs> and on the screen, that's very nice. I was uh, <laughs> um, wondering, uh, the Detroit scene of like the late 80s and early 90s kind of gave uh, the city a lot of really good music and it seemed to uh, like spoil or jade a lot of people uh, later in the 90s and kind of gave people just this like almost fuck you ethos uh, and like this really hardcore type edge and the scene itself has always just seemed like you know couple thousand people at a party where like you go to bigger cities like San Francisco or to Europe and you know you go to like 5,000, 10,000 people parties and with like the explosion with like Dampf you know, which seems to be the only thing in Detroit that's comparable uh, do you see anything like that happening in Detroit as far as the size or do you, do you see just people just wanting to do their own thing or? And Detroit's always been a strange place for that you know uh, it's uh, I think part of the the reason Detroit's so special, part of the reason Derek and those guys created the sound they created back in the day was that Detroit was never a destination. You know, you didn't come from Europe to go to Detroit. You went to Chicago and New York, maybe L.A. and to the West Coast. And it's just a bit off the beaten track. So that enabled a whole generation of DJs and producers to you know, be inspired by things that were going on outside of here but at the end of the day, just kind of lock themselves away and change and really innovate and do something different. And I think because of that special value here, in some ways, uh, people are much more interested in, in doing these new ideas and moving forward and, 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 and trying new techniques. And, and it nearly it alienates a group, of, uh, a group of people that could possibly take this to the next level here. But I don't know, it's, it's kind of nice Maybe uh, uh, it's selfish for me to say because I go all these other places and see these parties at five, ten, fifteen, twenty thousand people. But uh, you know, it, it's nice coming back here and doing some smaller parties and seeing the intensity of you know of, of the parties here and of the people who are really into it. Yeah, there's maybe not as many opportunities. Uh, maybe it's harder, but I think in a lot of ways it's more special. You know, I played. Uh, I don't know, maybe 150 gigs last year, something ridiculous. Um, and, uh, you know, anything from, you know, 200 people to, I don't know, 25, 30,000 people in front of me. And I think, you know, two of the best parties, if not the best, were the two here because of the history I've had here, because of my friends there, but also just because, you know, there's, there's something special here. And people, you know, they go, you know, they just gig.
so a major theme in, in what you've been discussing has been the idea of progression. Um, does that ever come into conflict with, with expression? And how do you reconcile that? Um, yeah, so it, it does. But uh, I think when it comes, you know, there there is moments in my career where I try to balance it so that I can have uh, fun at the same time as trying to be progressive and 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 different and, and come up with albums like Consumed or or or, or Concept or or whatever. Or even the parties we do, doing these environments. At the same time, we do our small you know small parties like in bars sometimes or you know when when uh, I was involved with 13 below in Windsor would have small parties there and and uh, you know and you know when I ha had more time in the studio I'd, I'd also come back with a kind of like a, f a funny piece uh, something a little bit more light lighthearted like robot man or do the do which was just a fun track you know what I mean so I want I want to enjoy what I'm doing and kind of have that balance so that you can, uh, you know, because if it gets too serious for me, I think not only am I going to lose focus on being progressive, but I'm going to just lose focus on the enjoyment of it all too. So it does get hard sometimes, and sometimes when I, when things just aren't working, I just, I take time off. I'm not in a big rush to release, you know. My, uh, um, you know, Clark wants me to release more. The label in England wants me to release more, but. Uh, um, yeah, you know, for uh, after the uh, music album on Plastic Man, I, t I took a long time off from Plastic Man. It wasn't really until kind of, and even a lot of the artifacts material was done, which I didn't think was that progressive, but I only thought that was able to be released after I released Consumed and kind of marked my new territory. And then it was like, well, for all those who don't really get where I'm going, here's something, a little bit of a blast from the past, a little bit updated, but, you know, kind of, again, balance those two things. Josh, what are you going to ask me? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> um, for anybody new, um, I guess getting into electronic music, would you recommend them listening to or experience? What, what, what would I uh, recommend them listening to? Or listening to, experiencing, um, I guess anything in general. Well, that's a hard <laughs> one. <laughs> well, the new Minus compilation that's coming out in two weeks. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> We don't have a minus compilation. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, that's that's so hard because there's so much good music coming out right now. Uh, there's so many different facets of of electronic music. So much history there. Uh, I guess I would say. I'd pawn this off to a friend. I'd say, go to record time and talk to Derek Placeco and, and see if there's some kind of good compilation or something that gives you an overview of things uh, to try and see kind of where your tastes lie, you know? Because um, there is so much development in electronic music. I think it's easy for some people to get overwhelmed and buy something and not really be into it. And, oh, I'm not really into electronic music. I just can't understand it. But you really do need the right way in to slowly kind of learn the, the alphabet of what we're doing, because it's really like that. It's, you can't just jump in and start you know, uh, reading a language that you've never read before. So, so I'm kind of not really giving you an answer, but it's a hard one. So, but if you want to, uh, um, you know, maybe another good way is to go see a really good DJ who's playing in this area who uh, has an open mind and is playing a, a, a kind of a wide variety of music in that way, not just going to see someone who's going to play a two-hour set of house or a two-hour set of techno, you know, going to see, you know, Derek play or myself play or someone like Laurent Garnier play or Sven Veit or, you know, even like, you know, someone like Carl Cox, as long as they're doing, a, you know, these people are doing long sets, so you get a kind of a scope and maybe during that night you'll be like, well, I kind of like this and this, this section, and then maybe you can explain it to someone at a record store or something. Oh, you can search for it on the internet, so. But it is, it's overwhelming. And now, I didn't give you an answer, so. <laughs> yeah, I just want to, uh, most of what we've talked about in the past hour has been, I mean, even the title of the program was Deconstructing Music, uh, taking things that already existed and, you know, tweaking them, flipping them, pulling the rug out from them. Where do you see the potential with this new technology, um, like the laptop-based stuff, um, getting back into actually constructing 
music that absolutely has never existed before as opposed mm -hmm. to just altering music that in some way has existed? Well, I think we're, we're at a, a little bit of a strange point right now because I find a lot of the technologies are still that are being uh, created for music making are still kind of based upon recreating in a computer what we've done in the past. You know, here's a virtual synth that sounds like a 909, well, that's a drum machine, but uh, a 303 or, or something like this. Uh, but I think, you know, slowly, as people are using uh, more and more computer-based things, people are starting to put different kind of equations and different angles on, on how, to, how to create music or how to create art generally. Uh, I know there's a new... Uh, synthesizer coming out from Germany and uh, it uses some type of binary reasoning or something I was reading about. I, I still don't understand what it does, but it sounds really, really interesting. But I think, you know, it's uh, as uh, technology progresses, as computers, you know, become faster, as all this, you know, uh, the typical kind of thing with computers and, and storage and memory uh, becomes cheaper and faster and, and smaller. It's just going to give uh, programmers and people more potential to to really play with things and to hopefully come up with something which is completely new you know and and also it, it, on a creative level uh, the use of laptops and, and, and smaller pieces of technology and is enabling many of us to work in different environments in different locations and maybe more often than we have done in the past five or ten years you know I'm, I'm starting to be able to write or at least uh, kind of do sketch work of ideas you know, um, away from my studio now, which I haven't really been able to do in the last 10 years. So maybe now I will have more potential to work on music a greater number of hours every year, and perhaps that will get me to the next destination a little bit faster, wherever that is. So I think it's a bit of everything. Is that it? What? I was starting to enjoy Last myself. <laughs> If no one has put their hand sure, up, we're no done. Sure, no more questions. This is your last <laughs> chance. <laughs> if um, I'm going to hang around for a while, so if anyone wants to uh, kind of see Final Scratch or doesn't believe it or whatever, they can kind of come up here. Uh, try not to all come at once, and uh, if anyone wants to, and. Uh, just be careful with it. <laughs> well, it's pretty robust, but thanks a lot. Appreciate it. And